Hey everyone, this is Steve Marinucci, uh, bringing you another edition of Beetle News Briefs. Today is October 5th, 2018, and it's the release day for Imagine the Ultimate Collection, um, the big John Lennon box set. Um, and we're going to have some things to say about that. Um, it's amazing let's put it that way um i mean uh, imagine it's a great album it's probably one of the best beatles solo albums there is um not all beatles solo solo albums could stand up to the treatment that this box set gives imagine um you have four cds of the remix of a remixed album, um, raw studio mixes, um, elements mixes with just basically elements. Um, for example, with Imagine, it's just the strings, which is really kind of interesting. Um, you have outtakes from the singles. You have um, the Evolution documentary, which is basically an audio um, where John talks about working on the songs and you can hear the songs in development um and then there's the the blu-rays uh, the blu-rays uh, also have the remixed album it has the quadrasonic mix which hasn't been heard in, in years um it has more outtakes um it has um the raw studio mixes uh and outtakes of those um again the elements mixes um and the evolution documentary um so there's a and there's also a hardback book um and it also has the Elliot Mintz uh interview of John and Yoko talking about the album which actually is one of the better parts of the set because it puts an uh an in-time perspective to the whole album rather than writing words, you know, now about looking back on the album. You have John talking about the album as it was as it was happening, which I think is, is very, very powerful and, and uh, very useful. Um, there's also, of course, the, the Blu-ray um, with um, the films Imagine and Give Me Some Truth that put a visual on what you hear on the on the uh, on the box set um and that's uh um the i mean uh, both have been released before the film imagine was on vhs but not on dvd and give me some truth was on dvd but you have the the remix and if you get the blu-ray you also have the the blu-ray and there are also um three added films on the um the blu-ray of uh jealous guy give me some truth and uh, a, a photo shoot so there's a lot there's a lot here and it's really like i said uh the, the, you couldn't really do this for every beatles solo album it just wouldn't work but with this one because every song is so good especially imagine and if you know the word iconic i suppose is used too much it's overused but in this case iconic definitely is a good word to use for imagine it it definitely means uh what it says and that and imagine has definitely become lennon's iconic song his trademark and but the whole album is is great. It stands up. And so to have this kind of perspective on John's work is just is really wonderful. And so I really give this thing a, a very good recommendation and I I wouldn't do that for you know all box sets of Beatles solo albums, but this one is definitely one that you might want to consider. Um, and to that end, uh, I'm going to 
after we get through uh, uh, with some of the news that uh, the other news that's uh, happening, I'm going to um, play you two more segments of my interview with Elliot Mintz, um, and we'll talk about those when we get there. Um, for now, let me uh, let's go through and, uh, and talk about the news. Um, Variety had an exclusive story this week that the Rolling Stones were going to be issuing uh, several new um, reissues. Um, they're going to expand Beggar's Banquet. They're going to expand. Um, they're going to do a re uh, a new version of the movie Sympathy for the Devil, um, and finally put that on Blu-ray, and. Next year, they're going to do an expanded video audio of Rock and Roll Circus um, and put that on DVD and Blu-ray again and um, and do audio CDs. And the interesting thing here is it's going to include unreleased tracks, including John Lennon's uh, John Lennon singing Year Blues and the Beatles Revolution. Um, of course, that also had Eric Clapton, it had Keith Richards and Mitch Mitchell playing with them. Um, I uh, inquired to see if there were any more unreleased Beatles tracks and I was told uh, they wouldn't have, uh, there would be no announcement of that at this point. So there may be more, but at least we know there's two um, unreleased tracks and that's going to be very interesting to to. Uh, look forward to next year. Um, I certainly will be looking forward to that. We also have um, the full list of celebrities that uh, were at the White Album listening session. Um, uh, I didn't have uh, um, the complete list when I gave it to you uh, in a previous um, podcast, but here, here they are. Um, uh, John Taylor, Matt Sorum, Jane Lynch, Bob Clear Mountain and Peter Asher um, were the celebrities that were on hand for that. Uh, and again, that was uh, that was a lot of fun. And it's going to be the the White Album is going to uh, be uh, a really cool uh, release when it when it comes. Here's a uh, a little Ringo note. Ringo's uh, been added as a special guest to the uh, second annual uh, Vets Aid Benefit Concert in. Um, in uh, Tacoma on November 11th, uh, that's going to have uh, Joe Walsh, uh, James Taylor, Don and Don Henley, uh, Chris Stapleton, and Haim um, appearing. So that should be um, uh, that's interesting uh, that uh, Ringo will be there. Um, now for some Paul news, um, he announced that he's going to put out a children's book in 2019 called Hey Grand Dude. Um, it's supposed to be kind of a uh, a take a take from uh, Hey Jude, but it's uh, the title comes from something he, one of his grandchildren said to him. Um, and if the and if uh, the grandchild is coming up with uh, a title like that, um, they've got some uh, imagination runs in the family, definitely. So that's something to uh, think about for next year. Um, Paul is um, playing the Austin City Limits uh, Festival tonight starting tonight and next weekend. Um, I did some checking into the recent set lists uh, um, to see if there had been any changes. And the last three shows in um, Edmonton, Winnipeg, and um, Montreal had no changes. Uh, so he's been playing the same set. Also, um, after I wrote... Um, about the passing of uh, Jeff Emmerich, I got uh, a note from uh, Peter Asher's manager with a statement from Peter Asher about Jeff Emmerich. And um, so, like I said, this didn't uh, get into the story, and I thought I'd, I'd add it here. It said, um, I had the pleasure of wor working with Jeff Emmerich on many of the records Gordon and I made back in the 60s, and it was always a pleasure and a revelation. And on a few rare occasions, I got to watch him at work with George Martin and the Beatles, which was even 
uh, which was an even more enlightening education. Jeff combined a hyper-professional mastery of all the traditional and technical skills of a recording engineer with a vivid imagination and a willingness to experiment. He was an enthusiastic collaborator and contributor, equally at home, quietly delivering solid accuracy or groundbreaking creativity as the situation demanded. He will be greatly missed and his sonic achievements will live forever. That's a, again, that was a statement from Peter Asher on the um, passing of Jeff Emmerich. Now let's uh, get into the uh, statements I promised you, or the, the clips I promised you of Elliot Mintz uh, talking about the box set and also talking about Yoko uh, and how she felt about it. And also uh, uh, the second clip will be, uh, I asked him, near the end of the interview about the Lost Lennon tapes and the history and we talked about that and he and he had some interesting comments there um, let's listen to those now well the whole the whole box set the whole creation was Yoko's idea she oversaw everything in this project this is a complete uh, hands-on experience with her there's nothing contained in any of those discs that she hasn't uh, heard uh, all of her input on uh, you know this is a very a special occasion you know she, that anything having to do with John uh, goes past her mm -hmm. and she treats his his legacy and his memory uh, with uh, enormous uh, reverence and soberness that uh, it, it's got to be perfect one of the things I wanted to ask was about just a little bit about the lost Lennon tapes um was that Yoko's idea, or was that your, your? Was that who who came up with the idea for that? I don't know if it's certain, but I think this is the way it went. Mm -hmm. um, I I was aware of all of the uh, materials uh, that that made up the Lost Lemon tapes. Mm -hmm. I, I just knew that uh, in the Dakota there were hours and hours and hours of uh, cassettes and tapes uh, laying around uh, finished stuff and in, in, in the storage rooms in New York and other places where there were outtakes and demos the, 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 the two of them documented almost everything at the time I was representing Westwood One Radio mm -hmm. and, I had, and I had a very good relationship with the um, the CEO of the company who I had individually represented as well and was we were old friends our relationship went back 20 years who, was, who, would, that, who, would, who would that have been? Norman Pattis P-A-T-T-I-Z he was the CEO of uh, Westwood One mm -hmm. and Yoko was in LA she was here for some reason and uh, one evening, I suggested that we all have dinner, Norm, Yoko, and myself. And I thought they would, all, they would get along. And yes, I, I think at the time, uh, I said to her, you know, or I said to him, you know, there are these tapes of John's that are just, you know, in storage and in closets, probably looking for some kind of a home. Maybe Norm said, um, gosh, Westwood One would love to do a radio show with some of those tapes. Or it could have been Yoko who said, well, let's meet with him and see if he'd be interested in some of John's tapes. Whatever it was, the three of us went out to dinner. And during the course of the dinner, we talked about the tapes. And by the time the dinner was over, uh, the two of them, Norm and Yoko, said, let's do something together. And uh, shortly thereafter, Yoko suggested that I host the show because of my proximity to the two of them and my familiarity with the tapes. Uh, Norm was well aware of my broadcast history and career. He knew that it would be, you know, not a problem hosting a radio show. Mm -hmm. And that's how it was born. It was very, very simple. Those were the days that thing, things took place on a handshake. And uh, 
you know better than I how many years it went on, how many broadcasts mm-hmm. there were, how long that run was. I, I, I still think it's probably the definitive portrait of anyone um, on media that ever lived. But it worked. It was... Uh, I knew a lot of people derive pleasure from that experience. And people are always saying to me, why doesn't the, the Beatles channel uh, put that back on the air and uh, one big package the lost lemon tapes? And I, do, I don't know the answers to those questions, so I'd love to see that happen. They're all there. All those broadcasts are easily accessible. Um, I'm, shocked at, I'm shocked at what bootleggers charge for them on the... Um, on the internet. How long did it take to from the from the conception point of conception to the first show? You remember? In other words, that dinner the the dinner to the first show. How long? How long was that? It was months. It wasn't weeks because they they made an agreement. Norman uh, and uh, Yoko made the agreement. Of the attorneys representing them mm-hmm. made the agreement. Signed the paper. I think with Norm and I, we just shook hands on uh, me hosting the show, and it was, you know, we didn't need lawyers. So um, the first thing was that I had to go to New York and locate as many actual tapes, cassettes, uh, or reel-to-reels that I could find in the apartment itself to gather them, create an inventory of exactly what it was that I would be taking. Mm Mm-hmm. And this this was pretty precious material at a time that, you know, digitalizing something was not just a walk in the park. Mm-hmm. It was very complicated. So I packed up the uh, original uh, recordings and we sent them uh, via FedEx uh, to uh, Los Angeles, to Westwood One. Uh, I don't know how many were in the first uh, package, but maybe there was uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 hours of the uh, original material. Mm. Thank heavens it was received, not lost in the mail. <laughs> and w- once it got to Westwood One, obviously their staff very gently took the uh, original recordings and made transfers of them uh, digitally and created their own inventory with their own numbers as to the, what's on it. These were boxes, sometimes marked, sometimes unmarked, and not immediately identifiable. John had a way of hiding a song five minutes into a tape recording of an Alan Watts lecture. Mm-hmm. They had to be listened to carefully. Then the originals had to be packaged up again and sent back to New York where they would be put in permanent safekeeping, and we would then work off of the digital copies that we made in a sealed, uh, secure safe. There wasn't a, a single tape that was ever lost or misplaced or bootlegged or stolen. It was under lock and key under the eyes of only two or three people, engineers and producers, who began the job of uh, taking the material and writing script and copy to go along with it, and then I would be called in to do uh, the narration. So, in, in, in answer to your... And I remember at the time, Musician Magazine mm-hmm. did a very detailed piece. This was a cover story called The Lost Lemon Tapes uh, in Musician Magazine of the year that it was released. If you find that online or something... Probably they can. Or, they know all of those details. Uh, and again, once they were ready, I recall doing the first show, which was a three-part special. It was three hours long mm-hmm. to introduce the Lost Lemon Tapes and tell people what uh, they would be hearing on a weekly basis. And it was... I know what was going to happen. I, I knew it was going to be popular, of course. It was, John Lennon was unreleased material. There was obviously interest, but the the numbers of the of that first broadcast of how many people actually listening surprised uh, everybody. Um, uh, so, 
<laughs> again, I, I, I did. I don't want people to ever think that that was all uh, Elliot's doing. <laughs> I mean, without the, the people who wrote the shows and the engineers and the, the people who transferred the material, there, there would be no show. Well, that's it for this edition. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, remember, we are on Podbean, iTunes, Spotify, TuneIn, and just about wherever you can find your podcasts. Uh, if you can't find it somewhere, uh, or if there's a favorite place you have, uh, let us know, and we'll try and get it there. Um, also, we'd love to hear your comments. Um, we've been kind of playing around. If you notice that uh, we've changed uh, theme song, we've 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 been kind of messing around trying to uh, uh, make this a little better uh, in getting this thing going. Um, we'd like to hear your comments uh, again. Um, please write to us at beetlenewsdesk at gmail dot com. Um, and again, thanks for listening. Uh, the numbers uh, of this podcast are are going up, uh, and we're glad to do this. This is fun um, being able to talk to you about the news and give a little perspective on things. Um, so there we go. Anyway, um, take care, guys, and we will see you very soon.